Welcome back to Randy Archives in Conversation. I'm here. Lisa is here. Hello. Hello, Lisa. Hello. And Bob Fisher is here. Hello, Bob Fisher. Welcome to the sofa. <laughs> uh, well, it's a very comfortable sofa, so I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Lovely to speak with you both again. You keeping well? Oh, well, we're not too bad, are no, we? No. Um, Good. Very well. well, that's we the best ha- you can hope for at our time of life, isn't it? <laughs> not too bad. Well, we've had an exciting day with, what, three DVDs arriving yes. today? Yes. Oh, well, crikey, so you got them. What have you got? Two DVDs and a Blu-ray, actually. Oh, a Blu-ray, yes. all right. All right, so, oh, uh, excuse me for breathing. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what have you got in the post this morning? Well, we've had The Underwater Menace. Yes, that's the, lovely. That, that's the Blu-ray, yeah. That's the Blu-ray. We've yeah. had Wurzel Gummidge Down Under. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, and I'm not uh, sure we should say what the other one is. And we're not going to say what the third thing is, because... All right, is it, is it Under the Counter? It, that... No, not really, but it, it's research for a forthcoming article on Rare the Archives. Oh, that's what they all say. We don't, we don't <laughs> want to give away what it is yet. No. <laughs> it's, it's research for a forthcoming article on Round the Archives, my oh. lord. <laughs> honest, <laughs> honest Gav, it is. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, say no more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have to say, Bob, this is actually the second time you've been in my ears today. Oh, so I feel like I should apologise. No, because I have a confession. Go but, on. Uh, Lisa, I got up before you, didn't you I? You did, yes. And this morning I went downstairs and decided to shoot some boys in uh, Fortnite, the uh, popular online game. Oh, I'm glad you specified that. Right, OK. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so whilst I was um, letting off rocket launchers into the faces of players, I was also listening to your Haunted Generation radio show. Oh, blimey. Yeah, so I was letting off explosions and singing Hosanna to the King of Kings at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) And and did you sing an extra superfluous of kings on the end of the chorus? And then realise that there isn't meant to be one there and look around furtively. I did that in the kitchen afterwards, yes, to to demonstrate to Lisa. (laughs) Well, I'm very, I'm very flattered. I should make another of those haunted generation radio shows at some point. They seem to be quite popular, but I haven't done one for a while. Well, I, I'm no expert on music, because anyone who's heard my heard my singing will know. But I, I find that those shows really stand up to re-listening because they're such a mixture of of styles and and content that there's always something in there that surprises me so thank you no it's really kind i mean i guess for those that haven't heard them I, we, uh, probably we should point out they're they're kind of me introducing it's like old play school records and playaway mm. albums and bits from the bbc radiophonic workshop and odd bits of folk music and things like that and it's it's an absolute joy to do they're they're a bugger to put together it takes me (laughs) days on end to do it uh, which is probably why I haven't done one for a while but I will definitely get round to it I I kind of I got half of a show together I think and then actual work arrived there's stuff for me to do that I get paid for so I did that (laughs) instead but I should go back and finish it at some point but they they do betray your love of television with with theme tunes and as as you say yeah. um, sort of play away and and play school songs and things like that and and Mr Safety who I'd never heard of can you explain <laughs> Mr Safety to to the listeners well Mr Safety was the original Green Cross Code man uh, like before David Prowse, a.k.a. Darth Vader, became the Green Cross Code Man, there was a character called Mr. Safety, who he would he would go into schools, and he looked a bit... He didn't look at all like Dave Prowse. He looked like, he looked like Peter Wingard, in all honesty. He looked like <laughs> Jason King. Um, and he had a kind of, you know, like superheroes costume on, but he would go around schools and... Uh, give talks about road safety, but, but he would sing songs as well. There was a Mr. Safety song, which was released as a single. It's got a curious, there's, there's, a, there's a B-side that's a bit of a ska record. It's got a bit of a blue beat feel to it. But he would go around schools and sing his songs, his Mr. Safety songs. And I'd, I'd 
since I, I I managed to get hold of a seven inch single of said ditties and stuck it on one of the haunted generation radio shows and uh, I since had a few people get in touch and say my god yes Mr Safety came to my school in 1973 or whatever so he was the original Green Cross Code man before he I, I don't know if he did strictly regenerate I don't know if we got a full regeneration scene, which is probably like hit hit by a hit by a Ford Cortina in the, in the middle of the A3, and uh, regenerated into Dave Prowse's Green Cross Code Man. I don't know if that happened. If it if it did, the footage has long since been lost. It needs reconstructing. It needs animating for the inevitable Mister Safety DVD release. But. Your use of the phrase haunted generation intrigues me. You wrote an article once about what haunted generation means. Yeah. So so yeah. can you sort of run through run through your thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. It all started it was kind of a life changing moment really. And we're going back to about 2012, 2013 here, and I discovered a record label called Ghost Box that just seemed to encapsulate so many of the feelings that I had about my childhood. So they make music and it's a a little collective of artists, people like Jim Jupp who co-runs the label and he makes music as Belbury Polly, Julian House who's the other half of the Ghost Box label, he makes music as the Focus Group, people like Kate Brooks who's the Advisory Circle. So uh, they were all making this music together and all of this music even though it was new music and the label is still ongoing and it's still brilliant, it was very much inspired by those feelings of being a child in the 1970s. Feelings that I always describe as basically <laughs> watching watching the open university modules on BBC Two on a wet Tuesday afternoon with chicken pox. It's that feeling, that feeling of boredom, melancholy, possibly slight illness and obsession with the TV. Like a TV over which we had no control whatsoever. If it was a wet Tuesday afternoon, you would just have to watch the Open University or the test card or whatever was on. So all of those feelings combined to inspire this wonderful music. So I became completely obsessed with Ghost Box Records and I pitched a feature to a 40 and Times magazine basically about this whole scene because it wasn't just them it was people like uh, Francis Castle who runs a, a label called Clay Pipe Um, Again, with a similar ethos, these faded memories. Uh, Clay Pipe is much more connected with landscape and with with memories of landscape and and, and the British countryside. Trunk Records, uh, Johnny Trunk does an amazing job at reissuing original 70s music, strange soundtracks and electronica. Um, who else did I speak to? Richard Littler, who is who's Scarfolk. Um, he runs this wonderful multimedia project called Scarfolk, which spoofs sort of 1970s public information posters and films. Very dark, very brilliant. So it was all of these people, really. Uh, Simon Reynolds, who's a journalist, who actually, I, uh, him and a fellow writer, Mark Fisher, uh, who's sadly no longer with us, uh, Simon and Mark kind of termed this scene hauntology long before I ever wrote about it. I am uh, completely standing on the shoulders of giants here because Mark and Simon were writing about this scene in the late 90s, early 2000s. But I, sp- I spoke to Simon for the article as well, and it was published in the 14 Times in 2017, and it was all about you know, how this scene had burgeoned, uh, uh, but also about why the experience of growing up in the 1970s seemed to have been such a profound influence on people making music and art and literature now in the 21st century. So it was a feature that explored all of those things it was published in 2017 you know i was very proud of it but i didn't think it would have the life-changing effect that it (laughs) did because within a couple of months the 40 and times letters page was just filled with you know readers saying how much it had really struck a chord with them and that this is a reaction that, uh, that i seem to get all the time is that people say oh my god i thought it was just me (laughs) <laughs> that thought about my 1970s childhood in this way, which is why I kind of, you know, I think of it as a support group. This whole thing, really. So, and that, and that, those letters kept rumbling on in the Fortean Times 
for about a year. It just never stopped. But on social media as well, I kept getting more and more people contacting me. And in the end, I, I approached the 14 times and said, look, could I possibly turn the whole haunted generation thing? Because that the feature had been called the haunted generation, which I still think is the only decent title I've ever come up with for anything. <laughs> but I said to the 14 times, could I turn the haunted generation into a regular column rounding up new music and art and you know anything else that's inspired by these these feelings that are lingering from the 1970s childhood and uh, david sutton the editor bless him said yes and so that's been ongoing since 2019 I've turned it into a website, which is a cheap plug here, hauntedgeneration.co.uk. So all of my stuff is is on there. Oh, that's in need of a little bit of an update. I've been busy. It's been a bit of a few months. So uh, there'll be some new stuff on there soon. And uh, the radio show was an offshoot of that. So I, I guess the whole thing is me. I mean, it's a very personal thing for me. It is about me exploring my own memories of my childhood and, and how the 70s... I think the 1970s was a, a unique decade to be a kid for so many different reasons. You know, it was a, a, a unique melting pot of pop culture influences. We were the first generation to really have TV as a massive constant influence in our lives. Sociological influences, Britain was finally moving away from the post-war years and kind of trying to grasp hold of modernity so you know you look at the 70s you've got things like even things like the metric system and decimalization <laughs> coming in in the 70s it's all britain moving away from old britain into what we now think of as modern britain and i think all of that and more just combines into this really it just feels like a unique decade to have spent your childhood now it's it's uh, those of us that grew up in in the 1970s i think have childhoods that were riddled with with a certain sense of melancholy i think it's just mm. a, a you know children's tv of the era is weird and sad and it's full of folk music and scary things and disturbing cartoons <laughs> and, and stuff that would now be considered wildly inappropriate for children. Yeah. But we got it as kids in the 1970s. So I think all of this stuff just combines to make, I, I don't know, just this feeling of disquiet, but quite a nice disquiet. When I, when I look back at all this stuff, I'm friendly with two brilliant writers, Stephen Brotherstone and Dave Lawrence, who do the Scarred for Life book. And I've done work with them, and you know, they write about all of this stuff as well. I don't particularly feel like I've been scarred for life by all of this stuff. I've, <laughs> I, I have warm feelings. I have warm feelings towards my 1970s disquiet, but I understand completely by others why others would feel scarred by it. Well, one, one of the pictures you've got on your website is that frame from the opening titles of Bagpuss. Yeah, which is the 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 sepia picture of those three kids in, in the in the village, and that's a good example because not only does that picture make me think of Bagpuss, it also makes me think mm. of Sapphire and Steel story four. Yeah. I never saw Sapphire and Steel on original transmission. I only came across it on pirate video in the very early nineties. So so I'm I must admit I did miss out on a few of these weirder things because i never <laughs> saw children of the stones either oh I right mean, I, okay yeah again i only saw that i think nick showed showed me that um on on video i've never okay. seen children of the stones even though uh avebury is not that far a car journey away right. from me and, and it's weird that some of this stuff just passed me by so I, i'm still discovering some of this stuff even now it, it's quite interesting oh. That's the lovely thing, I think. There is so much of this stuff to discover, and it's absolutely mm. still out there, but you know, still, still buried. I mean, you know, there is there is stuff that's, you know, personally, there'll be stuff that I haven't seen. There, there will be, you know, I will have my equivalent of your sapphire and steel stuff that you know, stuff that everybody else has seen, but I've never got round to. But yeah. I just love the fact that there's still prime examples of 1970s weirdness coming to light because I thought it was terrific. It was it was about a year ago, I guess, when Network DVD, God rest their very souls. Uh, I do miss Network, uh, but they put out an early 19. 
1970s kid serial called The Intruder that is just extraordinary. And, it, you know, it's Milton Johns as this, this man that appears in a, a remote Cumbrian town, this kind of slightly down at heel Cumbrian town, and claims to be a relative of you know the family that run the local guest house and sort of ingratiates himself within their life to a disturbing degree and, and he's dressed like frank spencer he's wearing a beret and a <laughs> mac and it's just the most unsettling piece of television and until Network released it on DVD a year ago, I'd never heard of it. I'd never heard of it. And I and I spoke when I saw that it was coming out. I spoke to you know quite a few friends who and you know who absolutely like enmeshed within this scene. We know our 1970s weirdness, and none of us had heard of it. So it was absolutely incredible that this thing had just been lying there in the archives for 50 years, waiting for Network to release it. But it's a phenomenal piece of television. So. I still like to think there's stuff like that lying around that we still haven't seen. It's definitely loads of... Because, you know, I, I'm sure you share my frustration that the, the BBC archives, and in particular BBC children's programmes of that era, mm. pretty badly represented on DVD, I think. Um, for one reason or another, you know, I, the BBC just didn't feel they wanted to release this stuff themselves or that they didn't want to license it to anybody else. I don't know, but uh, there are brilliant children's serials from the 1970s that I would love to see on DVD, but I don't hold out any hope that they're, that they're going to arrive anytime soon. You know, where's Kizzy? Where's Fish? Where's the Machine Gunners? Where's Breaking the Sun? All of these incredible children's BBC serials just floating around. Fuzzy copies on uh, on YouTube is the best we can hope for. Also, let's not forget the books side of all this as well, because you, you mentioned Kizzy there. I remember it being on, but I also remember having the novelisation. I think it was the D decoy it was it is by rumor godden yeah yes and i think i must have picked that that up one month as part of our book club at school because we had a we had a book club where you had to buy a book every we had the same yeah was it the puffin club ours was the chip club which was the chip the chipmunk logo (laughs) and and every december you'd always order the chip club diary which was edited by, by giles brandreth would you believe <laughs> <laughs> which which had a joke or or some fact on every day so yeah you you'd spend a year in the company of Giles Brandreth <laughs> oh and why wouldn't you want to spend a year in the company you? of Giles Brandreth <laughs> i would spot but... into Giles Brandreth in the street in Barnard Castle Good very Lord. charming <laughs> <laughs> there you go we had a short conversation about Simon Cadell from Heidi High who was his best friend <laughs> oh Fair enough. There you go. There you are. I'll chuck that into the mix. But yes, no, absolutely. Books play a huge part in this as well. And I'm delighted to find you had the book club at school. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. We, I'm sure ours was the Puffin Club. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You, you had a form to fill in, didn't you? That's right. You'd you have to tick, put a tick, tick next tick, to the ones tick you wanted. what you wanted. Yeah, that's right. Yes. I know how I had the novelisation of Striker by Kenneth Cope, which is the football oh, team. Right, yes, of course. And, <laughs> and, Hopkirk and, deceased. And, and I loathed football, but <laughs> <laughs> because it was on the telly as a children's serial, I got the book for right. some reason. Ah. I, 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 don't know why why I went. For I that haven't one. read that, but I maybe because I love football, um, <laughs> so that's, I, I've never been convinced by any representation of football in, in in or on film, on TV, or in literature. None of it. None of it ever feels like actual football to me. Well, how would you react if an episode of United was ever returned to the archives? Would you Would you be interested in seeing that? Of course, no, I would absolutely. <laughs> yes, it's just possible. You see, I'm a Middlesbrough fan, so. It's it's just possible that not none of these media can ever capture the absolute abject tedium of watching Middlesbrough Football Club <laughs> on a regular basis. The, as, as, as Ted used to say in Heidi High, first rule of the comedy spike, must have reality. <laughs> just, they don't have the reality of, of sitting at a Middlesbrough match, watching your knuckles slowly turn blue and wondering what to have for tea that night. <laughs> They make it look far too exciting. Getting back to your childhood watching yes. TV, I'd just like to place you in some sort of timeline because I, okay. I, I, I roughly, I think I roughly know your sort of 
your timeline, but what's your earliest uh, memory of Doctor Who, for example? My earliest memory of Doctor Who, I think... I've actually been thinking about this quite a bit recently. I think my earliest memory of Doctor Who is potentially my earliest memory of anything at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is the cliffhanger to part one of Terror of the Zygons. Oh, gosh, Um, you, you would have been young then, surely. I, so I was. You can you can do the math here, as people say. T- t- um, two or three. I was, I was born. Right. I'm not sure when this is being broadcast, but it's actually my birthday tomorrow. Oh, um, so <laughs> Happy I was birthday. I was I was born on the 15th of November 1972, which I think makes me less than three years old. When yes, Terror it of does. Zygons Part yeah, One was broadcast. Yeah, because that that's August. I think that's August September. I think isn't it's it, Zygons. Is it yeah. August 75? Yes, I think so. Yeah. So I, I, for years, I had this memory of being at my grand's house uh, in Acklam, a little suburb of Middlesbrough, and all I remember, it was definitely Doctor Who, and there was uh, basically the camera zoomed in on, in my head, an orange monster in a doorway, mm. and a woman screamed. Yeah, that's got to be and, it. And I know it was Doctor Who, and I know I was very, very small, and it was only when the VHS uh, releases started to come out that I, you know, in the 1990s that I was able to watch Terror of the Zygons and say, yep, that's it. That's absolutely <laughs> it. That's what I remember. So I think it's, I think it's that, and I, I can't think of any memories I have that uh, from before then, but I also remember we lived in, uh, for a short period of my childhood, my very early childhood, we lived in a very small kind of farming village on the brink of the North York Moors, a place called Ingleby Arncliffe, which is still there and still kind of as it was in 1975. I get a huge kick of very early nostalgia when I drive through it now and I can see our house. And I also remember because my dad was a builder and he basically built the house. We we bought a plot of land and we lived in a caravan on this, on this windswept plot of land with the North York Moors sweeping above us while my dad built the house but I remember being in our unfinished front room in the house and there was a portable black and white television on the floor and I remember watching play school and I remember two really vivid memories from uh, watching play school in that house and again I would have been about three at this point I remember an episode where Lionel Morton who's a fascinating figure in his Mm. own right. He's one of those children's TV presenters that had come from, I think he'd been in like Liverpool beat groups. I think he was a bit of a Mersey beat fella, Lionel Morton, but he became a a play school presenter. And there's an episode where Lionel gets the hiccups. And that was my (laughs) favorite, that was my favorite episode of any TV show at that point. And I get, I guess, play school must have been repeated on a regular basis in the mid 1970s, because I always, Whenever Play School came on, I used to say to my mom, "Is it the episode where Lionel gets the hiccups?" <laughs> and, I, and, I, and it seemed to, uh, like, on on a reasonably regular footing, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved that one, and then I was also uh, completely inexplicably terrified of one particular Play School presenter, who mm-hmm. I would scream whenever he appeared, and I can I can tell you why. <laughs> It's because he 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 occasionally had a beard, and I was absolutely terrified of beards yeah. as a, as a small boy in the mid nineteen seventies, which was unfortunate because I've been I've been born into an era when virtually everybody had some kind of facial hair. <laughs> um, I, th- I think even my mum had a pair of sideburns and a Zapata moustache at one point in the mid nineteen seventies. But it was Fred Harris. I was yeah. really really scared of Fred Harris, which I think. <laughs> I think bled over into my nightmares. It, it, at least I hope it bled over into my nightmares, and this wasn't real. But also, my one of my earliest memories from that period is lying in my bed at night, and uh, a little man called Fred used to come into my bedroom at night. <laughs> I would. I'm not joking. I remember lying in my bed, absolutely terrified, and a, a little, it was like a puppet, like a little man with a head like a puppet, would just put his head around my bedroom door and say my name in a horrible, <laughs> breathy, Ooh. sing-song voice. He didn't have a wooden spoon with him, did he? <laughs> it, uh, no. <laughs> oh, good good ragtime knowledge there. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 I honestly, I can't explain it. 
it's still when I think of that in, let's call it the incident when mm -hmm. I think of it now it still makes me shiver slightly <laughs> because I don't know what it was I've asked my parents they have no recollection of it at all and so it, I, I'm, I'm assuming and hoping that was a kind of distorted nightmare version of my fear of Fred Harris from play school <laughs> so I can legitimately say that Fred Harris haunted my nightmares <laughs> <laughs> but he is, which is, I feel very unfair on Fred, who it was the you know, benefit of hindsight. Fred was a brilliant television presenter, uh, uh, by all accounts, seems to be a lovely bloke as well. So apologies, <laughs> Fred Harris. But what what about ITV though? Um, your Time Tees region? I am absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah in the Time so, Tees so, region from so, Billsdale so, and Pontop Pike transmitters. So run us through some of sort of Time Tees' output because it's not a region I'm that familiar with. What what, what sort of shows did they make? Very little. <laughs> <laughs> that would be it then. The, the reason you're not familiar with Time Tees' output is <laughs> not an awful lot of it. So I can tell you, uh, 1977, uh, a series called Nobody's House. No, oh, I know, oh, yeah. I know, I know the name. We have we, it on DVD somewhere. We, we, yes. we do have it in the house. Apparently, you have, right? Lisa, Lisa confirms you've got it on DVD somewhere. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you clearly <laughs> never watched it. No, is yet. it is it on the to watch pile? Is it still in its, its shrink wrap? Uh, probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not really a pile. It's more sort of a mound. It's a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's yeah, we've all got one of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've all got a mound in the house somewhere. Um, <laughs> Yeah, nobody's house is uh, it's a ghost story. It's uh, it's a, a children's comedy ghost sitcom about uh, it's a family that move into. I assume it's meant to be in the northeast, seeing as Tyne T's made it, but uh, there's no reference to it on screen as far as I recall. It's uh, William Gaunt is the dad uh, of uh, No Place Like Home fame, and indeed, oh, which which of the Daleks is William Gaunt in? I always get them mixed up. Oh, it's Re Revelation, isn't it? Mm. It yeah. is Revelation, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Colin Baker. Yeah. So it's uh, William Gaunt is the dad, and uh, basically the house they move into is haunted by the ghost of a Victorian urchin who's just called Nobody. Uh, hence nobody's house uh, so there's that oh there's an earlier one a slightly earlier one that you might know uh, The Paper Lads I think is a Tyne Tees production I only know The Paper Lads through your reference on the Haunted <laughs> Generation show when you get did you get a Andrew Smith to say yes. it a lot yes <laughs> well he's because uh, The Paper Lads is a very Geordie series it was filmed around Gateshead do you know what now I say this I'm starting to doubt whether it is a Tyne Tees production was it another <laughs> ITV region that came to Gateshead and made it I'm starting to think it might have been <laughs> should we look but, should we look this up at least have we got an episode of that knocking uh, around I'm not sure because all I know is Ian Callan isn't it oh <laughs> what's his name Dave from Minder is in the paper lads. He's the main fella yeah. in the paper lads. Yeah, I think it. I Lynn think Ian Callum wrote it. All yeah. oh, right, okay. So yeah, I don't know. No, <laughs> I believe I don't you. I believe both of you. I, 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 do you know? What? I'm gonna. I'm gonna Google it now because I'm right next to my computer. You can leave all this in if you want. Let's call this. Let's call this research. Live research on air. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I can edit the pauses out, don't worry. <laughs> no, I'm taking it. It is absolutely a Time Tees production. It is, I, I, right. uh, f forgive me, Time Tees, for ever doubting you. Yeah, written <laughs> by Ian Cullen, and uh, it, it is it's Glyn Edwards uh, from Minder as the main guy in it. Uh, it's 1977, so it is around the same time as um, as Nobody's House, and that's like you know a, a, a team of a team of paper lads and one paper lass um, getting into all kinds of scrapes around the streets of Gateshead which is where my Last of the Summer Wide loving compadre Andrew T. Smith is from. So um, I can't say the paper lads with genuine authenticity because I'm, I'm from too far south. But he's very good at saying the paper lads. <laughs> I won't even um, attempt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't need him best, anymore. Best I nailed not. it now. Yeah. So that, and then our, our big hitter, the big Time Tees hitter from the 1980s. If I say the phrase, you wee scunner, I'm sure you know where I'm coming from here. Super gran. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> 
<laughs> Super Gran was uh, our, our big time tease hitter in the 1980s. And I, I always I always take delight in doing this every year. I, I, I stick this on Twitter or X or whatever it is he's called it every year because uh, it is it is my delight to report that Gudrun Ewer, who played Super Gran, is still with us. People assume she won't be, but she is. She's um, she, she's nearly a hundred now, and and every year on her birthday, I do a little post to say happy birthday to Gudrun Ewer, Super Gran, still thriving at the age of I think she's about ninety seven, ninety eight actually. And people always reply and say, bloody hell, Super Gran's still alive. <laughs> yes, she is. We should all rejoice in that. You say about being scared of things. And Lisa, mm. you, you must admit that um, there are some things made for kids that you don't really remember at the time. No. But now you find a bit disturbing yes. to watch. And mm-hmm. and one of your sort of bugbears is yeah. some of the puppets in Pipkins, yes. isn't it? Some of the puppets in Pipkins, <laughs> not all of the puppets in Pipkins. <laughs> well, which are your particular scary ones well i i find the the first top off deeply disturbing yeah because Mm. he's got cold dead eyes (laughs) (laughs) a sort of zombie monkey yeah yeah they they kind of remodel it don't they the the puppet probably because it fell apart yeah um because they're notoriously sort of shabby aren't they well i know pig was notorious for every now and then the the puppeteer's fingers would poke through its neck yes oh i've never (laughs) noticed that that's pretty horrible (laughs) well, that's why it wears a scarf in some of the episodes. It's to keep to its actually, head off. Yeah, to keep the head off. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was I was lucky enough to interview Nigel Plaskett a couple of years ago for the Haunted Generation website. And I, and I asked him about the, the puppets being tatty and he said it was absolutely deliberate. They just, you know, they, they, they didn't want them to be shiny and new because you know, kids were poor in the 1970s. We, did, we didn't have shiny new toys and puppets. And, it makes sense you know, because teddy bears. essentially they were knocked up in an old man's shed, weren't they, mm. really? Essentially, well, it, it, it comes to, it it comes to us all. But um, we're awaiting the, the, the Pipkins sort of mega box set, aren't we? Yeah, from, it's, it's, from Kaleidoscope. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's it, been delayed. It's been delayed because they keep finding new episodes. <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? Is yeah. it? Is it all essentially from Nigel Plaskett? Yeah, yeah, I think Nigel Plaskett keeps... keeps going, Oh, I found another one! <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. I just, like, in my head, Nigel Plaskett, who I guess like, you know, he is he is Hartley Hair, Nigel. I, don't, I hope I'm not spoiling that for anybody. Uh, in my head, like, uh, like, at the back of his house, there's like an Indiana Jones-style warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps going in and, like, pulling out a casket. And there's another 50 episodes of Pipkins in there. <laughs> Or in 1970s videotapes. Um, how many episodes of Pipkins were there? There must have been about 4,000. They keep finding them. Yeah, that's quite, quite a lot, isn't it? Is it going to rival our um, Crossroads box oh, set God in the no, end, do you think? It'll probably have to be winched in or something. So. Um, how much of your Crossroads box set have you actually watched? Uh, we're currently on in 1979. We're just before oh, the ITV strike, strike, aren't we? Yeah, we've got two episodes to go and then it'll be uh, the strike happens and it'll be October but right, yeah, we're, okay. mired, we're mired in Reg Cotterill time at the moment which is deeply yeah, depressing yeah we've got a lot of I- <laughs> Iver S- yeah we've got a lot of Ivor Salter being f- all fire and brimstone and yeah. making Benny swear on the bible yeah so- <laughs> on the biggest bible you've ever seen as yeah. well yeah so. oh I, I do you know I I, I kind of toyed with the idea of buying that Crossroads box set when it came out. I thought, do 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 I need that much Crossroads in my life? And I, I, I came to the possibly rash decision that I didn't. And then I, almost immediately afterwards, Network went out of business. And I, I don't know what it goes for. Now, you you probably have to pay. <laughs> you don't have to sell your house to buy the Crossroads box set these days, do you? Well, you've done the sums, haven't yeah. you, Lisa? And actually, in terms of material per pound, mm-hmm. it was actually pretty good value, It was very good it? value, yeah. 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 It was something ridiculous like... 10p an episode or yeah. something. So. so 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 slightly yeah. more than the actual budget of the yeah. of the episode. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, if you'd knocked it down to eight pence an episode, I might have been tempted. <laughs> uh, the one I was really hoping for, because uh, the network at the end just went through this phase, and I loved it, of, you know, they weren't doing, oh, series one, and six months later, he's series two, and then a year later, he's series three. It was just like, well, what the hell? Let's just bung the whole lot out in a box set the size of a breeze block. So I... I I, I mean, I didn't buy Crossroads. I did buy the Give Us a Clue box set, uh, which I <laughs> raced through. I watched the whole thing in about six weeks. Um, <laughs> and I, but on the back of Crossroads, I thought, oh, God, please, 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 let them do Crown Court next. Oh, oh. an entire, you know, the all of Crown Court <laughs> in the huge box set. I would, I would have snapped their hands off for that, but sadly, I'm guessing not to be. I think we've got... Have we got everything that was got made everything available? Everything that was released. Yeah. yeah. Which is yeah. still a fair chunk. Yeah, it's eight, eight, yeah eight eight volumes, it is. Isn't it? So, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, we still haven't finished no. all of them, have no. we? Well, the last so. time Oh, they're compulsive. I love them. Yeah. yeah. It's proper <laughs> drama. It's literally, it's pure TV drama, Crown Court. It's just, it's the, it's the actors in a completely tiny closed set and just, just get in front of the cameras and act. It's fantastic. I, I genuinely love Crown Court. I used to I used to find it hilarious that my gran, you know, my, my gran who had the house where I was introduced to the, the terror of the Zygons, literally. Uh, my gran used to watch Crown Court um, every day because she 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 worked in uh, she worked in Mr. Murray's news agents around the corner. Uh, but she used to get back in time. She did half days, so she used to get back in time to watch Crown Court. And I used to find that oddly hilarious i just couldn't work out why you know why she found it so compulsive because it seemed really boring to me as a child and then when i watched the dvd it's like oh my god i get it gran forgive me she died in 1989 <laughs> but somehow from beyond the grave forgive me crown court is genuinely brilliant but again that was one we just took a stab on wasn't it because yes. we had no yeah. opinion one way or the no. other it was just right. it, it was mm -hmm. 1972 mm -hmm. from your birth year wasn't yeah. it and you wanted mm -hmm. something from 1972 yes. so we were, well right. it, it's cheap and there's some actors in it we quite like yeah. so <laughs> and, and then by the end of the first disc we went oh more please yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. no brilliant series Sorry, did you ask me a question at the start of all that, and did I answer it in any kind of satisfactory I've, I've utter, manner? I've, utter, I've utterly forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> I'll only find out when I come to edit it. So, oh, I told I you mean, I no. get distracted and I ramble on a bit. As as people say, there's a difference between watching shows and becoming a fan. So, mm. at what point did you have to ad make that admission to yourself that you were a fan of TV, that you um. knew more than? perhaps was good for you <laughs> <laughs> oh i think it's always been good for me um, it's curious isn't it I, I i think we grew up so obsessed with tv because i think we grew up in a i think we hit a sweet spot i think we're unique in having grown up during a period and again this ties into the whole haunted generation thing i think we're the first generation like I said, that had TV as an almost constant companion mm. um, throughout our lives. So, you know, my, my parents would have been teenagers when they first saw our television because they were born around 1940. So, you know, it was the 1950s before they saw a television and had one in the house. So they'd lived, you know, they'd lived a decent chunk of their lives without any access to television at all. Those of us born 20 years later than that, around 1970 or thereabouts, we'd never known life without TV. And TV was massive for us, and it was always there. It was a fixture in the corner of the front room. For most of us, it was something that was constantly on. You know, I mean, when I, I occasionally meet people that you know weren't allowed to watch TV or the TV went off or whatever, I'd, I'd just baffled by that our, our television was on constantly even if it was the test card showing during the day it was still on it was the focal point of the house but i think the flip side of of that little focal point that little nexus point in tv history is that we had no control over it we just had to watch what was on you know at the same time as everybody else so it was a common cultural communal experience we all saw the same programs 
together. We all talked about them the next day. And we never had any hope that we'd see this stuff again, you know, barring the odd repeat. I I never had any expectation that I'd ever be able to see my favourite episodes of Doctor Who again. So I think those two things, the fact that we had TV as a constant companion and that we watched it as given to us, scheduled, we had no control over it, we didn't think we'd ever see it again, that gave it a huge potency for us. And, you know, by the end of the 70s, you've got video recorders starting to appear and suddenly we've got control over what TV we watch or more control over what TV we watch. When did you get your first video? Oh, outrageously late. Christmas Day, 1987. There were remote tribes in the Amazon that had a video recorder before my family had one. <laughs> um, yeah, very, very late. When when was it for you? August 87. Oh, right. So, wow. OK. Did yeah, you just I got- beat us? I got mine just in time for season 24 of Doctor Who. And I, rent, I <laughs> rented it. I, I hadn't bought it. I rented it for <laughs> £45 for three months. <laughs> Brilliant. And I had four <laughs> scotch tapes. <laughs> I, th- I think we had a video in the early 80s, I think, because I remember, I think, I should remember better because I was 11. Were you trying to explain you know, it to your grand oh, how it I, worked? That was in the 90s. That was hopeless. <laughs> that was, that was like, she could not understand it. It was like witchcraft. But I, I think we saw a pirate copy of E.T. Right. on video. So that would have right. been, been mid eighties, actually. Okay. Because it would have been on the telly till then. Oh, uh, how how about this for pure sacrilege? So, uh, I was at Christmas Day, nineteen eighty seven. My dad and I didn't know it was appearing. So we opened all of our presents. It was just me and my mum and my dad. I'm the classic example of an only child. We just opened all our presents together, and that was fine, and it was all lovely. And then my mum said, oh, and there's one extra thing that you don't know about. And she went upstairs, and she came down with a video recorder, our video recorder. I was like, oh, my God. And not only that, she rented two tapes from the local video shop in our high street, and they were, uh, both me and my dad were huge Monty Python fans. Uh, and my mum had rented Monty Python and the Holy Grail and Life of Brian. So the first thing we ever watched on our video recorder on Christmas morning, 1987, <laughs> was Life of Brian. <laughs> and so it would have been struck down by lightning for that. It's virtually blasphemous. <laughs> But I'm very proud of it. And the first thing I ever recorded on a videotape was a Christmas episode of Porridge that was on that lunchtime. Because we said, let's tape Porridge and see if it works. And it did. Did you tape that year's Last of the Summer Wine Christmas special? I don't know if I did because uh, ta- you know, tapes were expensive. They mm. weren't hard to, they, were, they weren't easy to come by. I'm not sure. We, I, I'm not sure I had any blank tapes to spare by then. I think we had one blank tape, but it's like there we go. We'll use that. But I remember. I will tell you what. What must have been on that Christmas as well? Because I remember recording uh, the film version of No Sex Please We're British, <laughs> <laughs> Roddy Corbett, uh, uh, my, uh, my dad saying, "Right, I am not spending." 15 quid on a blank videotape for you to record second rate British comedy films on it. <laughs> to, to which I replied, second rate? What are you talking about? So, yeah. But I do, I do genuinely think that changed things. Oh, it changed our relationship with television. You had to remember. I mean, particularly if you if you were a fan of something like Doctor Who, I, I actively remember watching Doctor Who in the in the early nineteen eighties, and I think right, I've got to really really concentrate on this because I want to remember every single aspect of it, every line, what all the monsters look like, all of that stuff. So, and, and obviously, once we had video recorders, we didn't need to do that anymore. So. I think the reason why TV in the 70s was so potent and kind of encouraged fandom in a way, so to get around to actually answering your question at some point, (laughs) is because it was fleeting, because we couldn't keep it in that way. Mm. We didn't have control over it and and we had no hope of, of watching it again. So I think that kind of encouraged us to obsess over the programs that we really liked. And and for me personally, that's certainly what turned me into a fan and, and, and what I think that's behind a lot of my nostalgia for the period is the fact that so much of the stuff that made a huge impact on me as a kid in the 70s, so much of that TV, I've just never been able to see again, you know, even now. 
I've not been able to see it. You know, the, where is the episode of uh, Swap Shop that I watched on the Saturday before Christmas 1981 where they showed the video for Dollar singing Mirror Mirror with the, you know, all the snow in it. And as I looked out of the window of my grand's house, it was snowing outside as well and it was the most magical moment. Well, I've never been able to see that since no. because I think it's gone. I don't think that episode exists anymore. So I think the fact that so much of our childhood TV is not just unreleased, but actually missing, we'll never be able to see it, mm. uh, lends this stuff huge potency as well. As for fandom, I don't know. I think, I think, <laughs> I think once you start making lists about things... <laughs> That's probably a tipping point into fandom, isn't it? <laughs> once, once you start, once, once you go beyond, oh, I like it when it's on... <laughs> <laughs> once, once you've got a spreadsheet well actually I want a full list of all the episodes that have been broadcast to date yeah. um, that's that's entering a different realm I think and, and one that I'm very good at entering but but what was your route into fandom were you a, ever a member of the Doctor Who Appreciation Society or no nothing like that no no I've never got into these things for the social life <laughs> <laughs> um no, I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, Doctor Who magazine, I guess. DWM. Yeah. I bought from issue one, so that was probably my first real awareness that there were other Doctor Who fans out there that were just as obsessive as I was about the program and wanted to write about it and pick it apart in absolutely forensic detail. So I guess that was a big thing. I remember buying the uh, the Doctor Who program guides, volume one and two, by Jean-Marc Lefissier. I got an A-level in French, you know. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and they had, you know, breakdowns of all of the Doctor Who stories that had been broadcast up to that point, which I think was 1981. And that was just fascinating for me, even though I had no expectation that I'd ever see those stories, to be able to look back and say, oh, so Keys of Marinus looks interesting. And uh, Right, okay, so that was the story in which Patrick Troughton changed into John Pertwee. Um, and that's why it happened because we just didn't know this stuff we had no access to this stuff it was like secret knowledge so I think once I became aware that other fans of the show did have access to this knowledge and that in roundabout ways through magazines and books it was available to me that was a big thing yeah I, th I think yeah I think once you once you start looking at the history of the show and wanting to know to know a bit more about the people who made it as well mm. you know I was I was I'm not sure I wasn't alone in this, but I just wanted to know everything about the writers of Doctor Who. Yeah. I wanted to know who's who's Peter Grimwade. Yeah, that's a brilliant name, and I love his episodes. <laughs> you know, what, where can I find out stuff about him? So once you start thinking like that, I think that's uh, that's the sign of a true fan, isn't it? Yeah. But do you actually remember the Five Faces of Doctor Who being broadcast? I do, and I, I, do you know what? A guilty confession, I wasn't a fully-fledged fan by that point, so I didn't no. watch it all. I, I remember tuning into episodes of The Five Faces, but I was, I was doing so because there was something else on BBC Two afterwards that I wanted to The watch. Adventure Game, I think. I can't remember what it was. Was it The Adventure Game? I think it's The Adventure Game, and you've also got episodes of Blake Seven on as well, I think. Uh, it would have been something evening. like that. Yeah, I think it would have yeah. been the adventure game, actually. That's most likely, because I did yeah, like the adventure so. game. I had watched Doctor Who at that point. I always say that the first episode that I really watched all the way through, the first story, was Destiny of the Daleks from 1979, which I still love, and it still mm. has a huge nostalgic kick for me. I was definitely more interested in uh, Tom Baker's final season, season 18. Um, can't believe I said season. I'm going to go old school, series 18. Um, no, 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 but... I, I have to contradict you there. Old school is actually to say season. Doctor Who fandom in the 80s always used the term season. So I, I've always been brought up using season 17, 18, 19 and series for the new stuff. Oh, wow, right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected. I just, <laughs> I just never, I never remember anybody talking about, oh, I, I see there's a new season of Doctor Who starting. <laughs> It was always well there's a new series on. Fanzines from the eighties are just full of the phrase season. I mean they would they'd say that on TV, wouldn't they? The continuity announcers. It was like a a, a, a brand new a brand new season on BBC One this autumn. It would be that kind of thing, wouldn't it, I think? Anyway, sorry, yes, uh, the uh, the nineteen eighty season of Doctor Who, the one that starts with the Leisure Hive. I was becoming much more interested then, I think, because I love the sound of it, that those soundtracks by Paddy Kingsland 
Holland and, and Roger Lim and people like that have stuck with me forever. I still find them incredibly evocative. I love the atmosphere of season 18. So it's often described as funereal. Is it funereal or funereal? I never <laughs> know depends, how to say it. It depends how well the writing and spell, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say, I'll go with. Um, just this, um, I've always responded to melancholy. I've always liked a bit of melancholy in my life, and and season eighteen of Doctor Who has a bit of that. So, and then I genuinely didn't know that the regeneration was coming. So, the moment where Tom Baker regenerates into Peter Davison at the end of Logopolis, somehow, again, it would never happen. Now, it would be impossible to be unaware that that was coming in 2023. But in 1981, apparently, it had been widely reported it was going to be that night but I did not know so I just sat down to watch that episode and at the end of it Peter Davison appeared and it was like wow this is amazing I've actually seen a regeneration and I am now a fan so from Peter Davison's first series onwards I lived and breathed it I absolutely obsessed over it. I, I, I suspect I rarely thought about anything else throughout the, my entire waking hours other than Peter Davison as Doctor Who. But Five Faces somehow, I don't know, it just I skipped over it. I possibly just wasn't that interested in the history of the show at that point. I wanted new Doctor Who. I wanted Peter Davison in the TARDIS with Adric, Nyssa and Tegan. And I wanted to see what happened next. Obviously, I've gone back over and I've, you know, I've watched all those stories since. I, I think I, I can proudly say I've watched every single episode of Doctor Who, including recons and animations. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I've, I've made up for it since. But at the time, no, guilty confession, I didn't watch it much. You're Davison, really, aren't you, Lisa, yes. as well? That y- you wouldn't see it on a Saturday, would you? No, no, I, I didn't see Tom Baker's last series properly because we always visited my grandparents on a Saturday. Yeah, love so it. So they did have a television. She, in fact, she, my grand had a black and white television up until the point she moved out of her house and came to live with us, uh, which my dad dumped on the door of Granada's and ran away. Because didn't you rent that? Yes, Hello. they rented it. And yeah. they didn't they didn't want it they didn't back because it, it was so no, old. Because it was black and white. And so so, black so and white. your dad fly tipped it yeah, outside did, the shop and ran away. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. So, so yeah. So I knew I never saw any Doctor Who until it went on a weekday. Yeah, right. And I'm okay. Amazed I, I saw it then because it would have been opposite something on ITV that it's probably opposite opposite Crossroads. Yeah. actually. Yeah, because yeah. it's yeah. that sort of six thirty kind of yeah. time, isn't it? So that's so, again. Yeah. When I was talking about that lack of you know that we didn't have control over what we watched, we were at the mercy of the TV schedules. <laughs> we obviously we were at the mercy of the rest of the family as well weren't we yeah (laughs) it's like they didn't want to watch it if you were outvoted then you weren't going to watch it my my dad thought doctor who was bloody rubbish so you know if i (laughs) it was kind of a no it wasn't i'm being unfair to him it wasn't a running battle with him but if there was something on the other side that he wanted to watch i might have to sacrifice doctor who or if we were doing something else like you say, you're at your grand's house. <laughs> it would be, turn that bloody rubbish off. Talk to your grandma. <laughs> there would have been a bit of that around, I think, and, and kind of no scope at all to catch up on it later. I think it does make a difference. And to be fair, at that point, they had an open fire and I was scared of the open fire. So I probably would have been in the kitchen with the... Cause they, put, they used to put the gas oven on to keep, to keep the kitchen warm. So I would have been in the kitchen. So I wouldn't even see the television. <laughs> you, were, you were scared of the open fire, so you stuck your head in the gas oven instead. Yeah. <laughs> would it would it spit at you? It just it was the noise the logs made. I think. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until my grand got she got a gas fire. Yeah. Um, and then she, <laughs> then she had to have a bowl of water next to it. What? Why? I don't know. What to keep the air pure? Yeah. <laughs> there was always a bowl of water next to the fire. <laughs> Okay. Oh, we we had an open fire as well. And my my memories of our coal fire are of the that we, we had a very shaggy rough collie dog called Ricky, who would like who would be regularly set ablaze by oh, bits God. coming out of the fire and would be entirely oblivious of this. So he would just conk out on a rug in front of the coal fire. And coal fires spit, you know, that's why you have fire guards, I guess. Uh, but little slivers of coal or, or, or wood, if we'd stuck a log on there, would shoot out and, and would set fire to Ricky. <laughs> my dad would say, oh, the dog's on fire again, sort it out with you. <laughs> I'm to go on. But I'm not talking like a raging inferno here, but there would be a little, like a little plume of smoke rising from his back end. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have to go next. <laughs> it gives a whole new meaning to put the dog out, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, um, I'm sorry to say, we we're just about reaching our our one hour mark. Is that believe. it? <laughs> Is that all I get? Well, well, no, <laughs> about I, two I, hours I, I, for last the summer wine. <laughs> I, I was I was going to say I'd asked you to make make it before. Yeah, I'm not going to finish yet, but. <laughs> I'd I'd asked you to make a list of your favourite shows, and I get oh, the feeling blimey. I get the feeling we've barely even scratched the surface. Yeah, on it's this. true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I loved g- all, I loved all TV. What can yeah. I say? You had to. Yeah. It was just it was there. It was what was on. So I mean, I can I can I can rattle off five if you want me to, but yeah. I, it would be it would be barely scratching the surface. What I was going to say is that just getting back to what you said about when things happened, like getting your first video and things yeah. like that. Do you remember? The arrival of Channel 4. Yeah, absolutely. I was incredibly excited. Now, here you go. Here's TV geekdom for you. I was so excited about the arrival of Channel 4 that I used to put Channel 4 on before Channel 4 was launched. So for a, a couple of months leading up to launch day, which I think was the 2nd of November 1982. Is that right? Well, well, I'd have to look that up. I'd have to I look think that it up, is. It was yeah, the day before yeah. my mum's birthday. Slightly ashamed to report, I was far more excited about the launch of Channel 4 than I was my mum's birthday so in the months leading up to it there was just the channel 4 test card yes um, yeah. being shown and i used to put the channel 4 test card on and i distinctly remember sitting with a piece of paper and all my felt tip pens and drawing the channel 4 test card i was oh, wow. so excited about a new television channel launching but the great thing about channel 4 from my point of view was again they had very little money to actually commission new stuff yeah. So they launch with Countdown, don't they? But yes. immediately start filling up the schedules with things like the Munsters, the Adams Family, yeah. uh, the Avengers, the Prisoner, all of which I would never really have seen up to that point. So again, you say about hitting a sweet spot for sort of archive yeah. TV. And Channel 4, I think, don't underestimate how important that was to somebody like me at that, that point in my in my life, just just showing me all this old stuff that I didn't know about. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I know a lot of people that got into The Prisoner from watching it on mm. Channel 4 in the 1980s, I think. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, ab- absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and my, our, our friend Paul, who contributes to Around the Archives a lot, he would have seen the Avengers, you know, from from the Channel Four showings more yeah. more than anything else. And again, all of this stuff we've now got in the house. Uh, we, you know, because yeah. we, we were deciding what Christmas specials to watch, and I suggested <laughs> we we should do the Adams Family because mm-hmm. we haven't done oh, that one in, in, in some time. But I, I wanted to ask: we're coming up to Christmas, so yeah. what Christmas specials? Do you always put on? Oh, hang on. Give me a minute. I might have to think about this. Do you do the Box of Delights every year, for example? Uh, absolutely, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I cannot tell you how much I adore the Box of Delights. It was a massive programme for me at the time. I was 12 when the Box of Delights was first broadcast in the run-up to Christmas 1984, and i just started secondary school and was possibly feeling a little bit insecure and a little bit unsure just because I'd gone to i'd spent the first not 11 years but until i was 11 i'd been to this very small um very cozy primary school and then suddenly i was chucked into this massive state comprehensive school you know in the summer of 1984 so a little bit unsure about all of that and still finding my way and the box of delight suddenly appeared and it just struck every chord for me, I'd become completely fascinated by kind of swords and sorcery throughout 1984. So fighting fantasy books were a big part of that, but also Robin of Sherwood as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that mixture of kind of magic and folklore and history, I just found completely intoxicating. And and Alan Garner, I discovered, you know, the books of Alan Garner I discovered in 1984 as well. I'd read The Weird Stone of Brisingamon and Moon of Gomrath and Elidor and The Owl Service. I read them all that year. So all of that kind of mixture of magic and landscape was in my head, and the Box of Delights just had all of that. Plus, uh, it had it had a Doctor Who connection in Patrick Troughton, which obviously got me incredibly excited.
United and it had this wonderful soundtrack by Roger Lim and I've, I've always been interested in TV music and great TV music is just some of the greatest music ever made and I think Box of Delights falls into that category and I've been lucky enough to get to know Roger a little bit in recent years and, and in fact worked with him a little bit and he's a gentleman and he's so so proud of his work on the Box of Delights and rightly so it's it's a genuinely beautiful piece of television so yeah Box of Delights certainly every year I love the Likely Lads Christmas special um, with the fancy dress party that's a big one for me I love there's a really good Ever Decreasing Circles Christmas special Terry and June Christmas specials there are a couple and I'm not averse to putting them on either just anything really it's a lucky dip of Christmas specials for me I'll just have a rummage through every year and see what I can find. Because you said, Lisa, we should look on BritBox because they've always got yes, a few they on always, there. It's all in December. They do a Christmas thing and yeah. they put diff- various different Christmas specials on. Because we did all the Terry and Junes a few we did. years ago. We, did. we, we loved we? them all apart from the last one. Yeah. And I don't know if that's because it was directed by somebody different. Yeah. Or it just oh, wasn't right, very okay. funny. So. Yeah, but and, the, certainly the first three yeah. out of the four that we I mean, saw. The one where they've yeah. got his, his boss over and they it, every time somebody stamps, the lights go out on the tree. It right, gets, yes. in, gets increasingly <laughs> funny as it goes along, doesn't it? Because so, there's, just, there's just so much stamping yeah. and, and silliness. And we also did a couple of No Place Like Home Christmas specials yes. the other year. Oh, wow, well, going we? back to yeah. William Gaunt. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, takes us, it takes us in circles, you see. Yeah. Every, everything's connected. We always... <laughs> We always say that. <laughs> Nothing is forgotten. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I wish you joy in re-watching Box of Delights this year. I guess Thank you will you. then. Do yeah. you arrange it so you watch the final episode on Christmas Eve? Or? Oh, do you know what? I've, I've tried so so often to do that over the years. And, uh, you know, you know what it's like. Life just conspires against you sometimes. You think, yeah, what we'll do is we'll watch an episode a week and then something crops up in week two and you don't get around to watching the second episode. So my, my tactic now, um, if I can get away with it, is at, at some point leading up to Christmas, you know, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, or, or sometimes even just Christmas Eve, yeah. Is just basically to binge the lot with a bottle of <laughs> Harvey's Bristol cream, a big slice of cake, and a, and a real Christmas tree in the corner of the front room. So the room absolutely honks of pine. That's my idea of heaven at Christmas. Do you make yourself a posset? <laughs> Do you know what? One, one year I was actually quite unwell at Christmas. As I've been, so like, apologies for anybody who's tuning in thinking, oh my God, Bob sounds rough. I've, I've had a cold this week, so I, I do sound a bit like a, 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 like a heavy cold plus a Teesside accent equals Chris Rea, I think. So <laughs> I, I, if I remind anybody of Chris Rea, I mean, that's possibly quite a nice thing. Um, I'm fond of Chris Rea myself. So yes, I've, I, I've, got, I've had a sore throat and a blocked nose and you can probably hear all of that but uh, yeah one year i did have a, a terrible cold at christmas and i thought i'm gonna make a posset because i'd watched box of delight uh, i'm gonna do it and this was lit i couldn't sleep i couldn't sleep during the night because you know throat nose everything so i'm gonna make a posset and see if that helps so i can't remember what goes in it it is just it's basically that like milk and eggs it's, isn't it and it's a, bit it, of- it's, it's a hag and some a jar of milk and a nutmeg yes. and you take yeah. it down hot yeah mm. <laughs> All of that, and, I, and obviously because I'm, you know, I'm 50, I, I put some brandy in it as well for, uh, you know, <laughs> Kay Harker wasn't allowed to do that, but I did, and I and I stirred it all up. It was absolutely <laughs> revolting. It was basically, it was like drinking, drinking slightly spicy but nevertheless liquid scrambled egg. It was foul. So so I, yeah, I just chucked the rest of it out and drank the brandy. The claim that it makes a new man of you, then, is, is an absolute lie. Well, it did, it did make a new man of me, but a slightly more unwell man than I've been previously. <laughs> well, I wish you a happy Christmas early, And to then. you both. It's been lovely so, to speak so with you both thank again. You thank much. you for having me. So, so, Bob, just uh, plug your wares again for the, for the listeners, where we can find oh, you. Okay, my, my website is um, hauntedgeneration.co.uk. Uh, there's the Summer Winos thing I do with Andrew T. Smith. That's summerwinos.co.uk. Um, and if I can do a terrible plug 
Well, actually, no, I'm probably a half decent plug. Oh, um, go on. But I mentioned that I'd been working with Roger Lim, uh, myself and Andrew, and another northeastern writer, Andrew Orton. Uh, we've launched a company called Mulgrave Audio to produce original audio drama, and our first release came out this year, and it's called Simon Perkins Lurgy. And uh, it is, it's a play what I wrote. And it's very much inspired by some of the stuff that we've talked about today. So those memories of, of watching TV in the 1970s, feeling slightly unwell. And it's about, uh, it's about a teenager called Simon Perkins in 1974 who becomes convinced that the continuity announcer on his grand's television set is speaking to him directly and initiating conversations with him. Uh, we got a brilliant young Teesside actor. Uh, he was only 14 when he did it, called Ethan Warren to play Simon. Uh, and we got actual Roger Lim to play play the TV announcer but because before Roger worked for the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and soundtracked Doctor Who and the Box of Delights he was a genuine BBC continuity man and he still has the voice it's just incredible uh, so Roger was a brilliant sport and he threw himself into it and we're really proud of it so yeah it's called Simon Perkins Lurgy we tried to make it sound as authentically 1970s as we could we've got open university module themes composed on original 1970s analog synths Roger did some music for it as well uh, and it's out there now and if you want to find out more about any of that stuff mulgraveaudio.co.uk terrible plug over well the best of luck with that bob and uh, thank you <laughs> thank for joining you. us and you're you're definitely gonna have to come back because yeah we've we've overrun our slot and i feel Sorry. there's a that, no no <laughs> no i'm not complaining <laughs> there's, there's a there's a lot more to do i think so come Anytime. back next year and we'll pick this up again so th- i would bob, love to bob thank you very much indeed so bye bye from us bye. and bye bye from bob bye bye <laughs>